Don't raise your hand, but how many lost your way and you heard the shepherd's call? I sure did. I sure did. I'm so thankful that I did. That he sought me. Not only for salvation, but as a believer, as a Christian, as his child. And yet falling away from him. In one point in my life. I think about it often. Reminding of it. And he sought me and brought me back. So thankful. So thankful. You know, I don't know if you've been keeping up with <clears throat> the terrible devastation that has occurred over in Turkey, Syria, that part of the world. So far, as of yesterday anyway, there's probably more, but so far as of yesterday, 47,000 confirmed deaths that they've dug out from all of the devastation, the debris. 47,000, can you imagine that? Can you even fathom that? That's nearly the double of the total population of Longview, Kelso. 47,000. An amazing thing though, on the great side, they have dug out two, two people yesterday after 10 days alive. Hard to believe. No water, no nothing, you know, under there, 10 days. God is moving. Earthquake in Crete. Earthquake in Oman. Another earthquake in Turkey, not in even the same area, more inland. 5.1 on the Richter scale. There should be earthquakes in various places. More of them. Frequency, intensity. And these will be the birth pains. I believe we're there. They recorded, seismologists and all those recorded, since the devastating earthquake in Turkey, Syria, though, out there, 7.8, 7.4, something like that, those two that were back to back, they have recorded, listen to this, 5,700 shocks that have come aftershocks 5700 aftershocks and many of the aftershocks were so strong that buildings and other things that were damaged by the initial quake they crumbled and they fell and that's what's so devastating by this earthquake over there you know two three four days after the initial quake buildings are still collapsing terrible and to think to think that Jesus said that a time far worse is coming unequaled since the beginning of time creation and never to be equaled again I pray for them I pray for God's chosen earthly people the Jewish people They'll turn to God, they'll repent, turn back to the Lord. Terrible, terrible times in that part of the world. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this opportunity and this day. We thank you for the privilege that we have in this country, we are still able to come together and worship. We're still able to carry your word about and listen to your word and have your word proclaimed and read your word. Not available in so many other places. We thank you that we can do that in this country, in this place. And we pray, Lord God, that because we are and have, we pray that you will bless your word to our hearing this morning. We pray that our ears and hearts will be open, our very spirits, Lord God, to your word. As we see these things unfolding, 
that you predicted and prophesied through your prophets so long ago before our very eyes. We ask for your blessing today in your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stuart, Stuart, could you get in my office? And there's a big book that choke a mule right on my desk, and I forgot it. I was so taken up with things. Thank you. How many have heard these things before? I bet you have. American philosopher George Santayana said these words. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Cicero, a Roman, long, long ago said, to be ignorant of what happened before you were born is to remain a child forever. Mark Twain, someone more to our present time of thinking, he said these words. He said, a favorite theory of mine is no occurrence is soul or solitary, but is merely a repetition of a thing which has happened before. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And the last one here is Edward Gibbon. And this is one we've heard often. How patient of history, it personifies history, how patient of history to keep repeating itself when practically nobody listens. So history keeps repeating itself. I'll tell you why. Number one is because God's in charge of history. And number two, because man is bent on wickedness and evil and rebellion against God. And so it just goes around and around and around. A cycle. I said those words because of what's going to happen according to the word of God in scripture. To Israel, of which we're studying right now, and how the rest of the world will be affected by it as well. In the terrible, terrible tribulation period that we've been talking about. I had you turn to John chapter 10, because I want you to notice this is only a week or two before Jesus will be crucified. A couple weeks. And he's in Jerusalem, and notice what it says. John, the apostle writing this, Stated, verse that uh, Ed read about, verse 22. It says, then came the feast of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter. So now a feast or a festival was something that most, if not all the Jewish people, came to Jerusalem to celebrate, to commemorate, like Passover of course, those was appointed feast by God. But many, many of the Jews were here remembering, celebrating, commemorating dedication in Jerusalem. And Jesus was there probably to keep this feast as well. The feast of dedication. You know it by another name. They just celebrated it not too long ago. It is the feast of or celebration of Hanukkah. Or if you really want to get technical in the Hebrew pronunciation of it is Hanukkah. Hanukkah. In fact, that Hebrew word means dedication. That's what that word means. Hanukkah. Dedication. Josephus, the historian, the Jewish historian, that's what this is. 
in the first century. That's a long time ago. He called it the Feast of Lights. The Feast of Lights. Now the Festival of Dedication, or the Feast of Light, was a feast that had been instituted by Judas Maccabeus in 165 B.C. I agree. Judas Maccabeus. It was to commemorate the purification and rededication of the temple. Temple of God. Now this is why the Jews all congregated back into Jerusalem. It wasn't because, oh, this is just a wonderful city and we just love to go there. No, it was because that's where the temple was. There was only one temple. And that was in Jerusalem. That is a place that God chose. God chose. And earlier on, it's where his Shekinah glory came down and dwelt. So it's where God dwelt with his people, Israel, in the temple. And it's where they were to sacrifice. They couldn't sacrifice anywhere else. They were to sacrifice there. The altar of the burnt offering sacrifice. Sacrifice. Only there. So it's Jerusalem. So all the feasts and all the festivals and everything that occurred occurred in Jerusalem. And that's where the people were to go many times. And it states there, just so that you can see it on a chart here, it states there that then came the Feast of Dedication or Hanukkah or Hanukkah. So I, I, I just quickly put together this Jewish calendar some time ago. The Jewish calendar, not quite like ours, because their calendar centered around all of their sacred feasts or festivals, holy feasts, like Passover and uh, Feast of First Fruits and uh, Unleavened Bread and, and Feast of Weeks or so-called Pentecost in the Greek name and everything. But this, this is their feasts. And you see, the Jewish people had two calendars. They had a civil calendar, that's what the C is, <clears throat> and they had a religious calendar where they follow the Lord's commands. And that's why the first month of the religious calendar, Passover, because that's what God had commanded back in Exodus chapter 12. Remember? First month will be to you. And of course, the... Uh, the Babylonian name was Nisan, Abib is the Hebrew name. First month. So anyway, this is it. And you can see right here, all the different feasts. These were appointed feasts. But there were other feasts that add, were added to it by the people at different times. Like Esther down here, the book of Esther, the Feast of Purim. And they were to keep that from then on, if you recall. <clears throat> but another thing was Hanukkah. Hanukkah. Right there it is. It's mentioned in Scripture, John 10, 22, what we just read. And that's what it means, dedication. And it celebrates the rededication of the temple. And that's where Jesus is in John chapter 10, right there, to celebrate the rededication of the temple. Really, his temple. <laughs> but what are they celebrating? Rededication. What, what happened? back in 165 B.C. or really 67, 66, 65, three years. I want to read to you. I don't want to bore you. It won't take me long to read through this book. I'm only going to read one little section. This is the historian Josephus. Now I want you to understand Josephus was a Jew. And to make a long story short, after the fall of Jerusalem, 70 AD, you find how totally documented, the fall of Jerusalem, blood shed everywhere, thousands upon thousands of Jews massacred and dead, and many, many more 
gone into captivity, the great diaspora. And remember, that's where the nation of Israel was just totally destroyed. Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple was leveled and destroyed just as Jesus had said in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. They all recorded it. Not one stone will be left on the other. All be destroyed. Well, that happened. 70 AD. And Josephus, the historian that was Jew, had, uh, sim was sympathetic to the Romans in a sense, and he ended up going to Rome and become a Roman citizen. He went with Titus after Titus, the general, destroyed and leveled the city and everything. He went to Rome, became a Roman citizen eventually, but he's still Jew. And then he was commissioned. He was given land back in Jerusalem, but he, he was commissioned to write a history of his people accurately. To write a history, because as far as they were concerned, they would be no more. They would be assimilated, the ones that were surviving in the rest of the cultures around the world, and there wouldn't be any Jewish people anymore. Of course, that's not God's plan, but that was the Romans' plan. So write a history of the Jews. This is it. It's called the Antiquities of the Jews. Written in the first century AD. And he talks about what this feast dedication was all about. He goes back to 167 BC. Now, if you all know your history and your geography and your history, you know we talked about the different world powers, how it was the Babylonians that sacked Jerusalem three different times and led Daniel and Ezekiel and others into captivity. But then they were allowed to come back and rebuild the temple under Cyrus because the Persians and the Medes, but mostly the Persians, conquered the Babylonians and their empire, and now they became the power. And then later on it would be Alexander the Great and the Greco Empire, the Greeks, they would come and conquer Persia, and, and the empire would become theirs, the power would be theirs. But then Alexander died. He was 33 years old when he died. 33. And so now for the next 22 years, there was fighting amongst his generals of who would become the power, ruler of the world, the empire. Well, after 22 years of fighting and feuding, it finally was divided by four ways, by his four prominent generals. And that's what Daniel is writing about, by the way, in chapter 11, especially. That's why it's a long chapter. But the wars going on between the Seleucid dynasty and the Ptolemy. The Ptolemies were in Egypt, the Egyptian dynasty. The Seleucids were in Western, no, excuse me, Eastern Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, uh, Iraq, Iran, almost clear to India, and Palestine. And one of the kings of the Seleucid dynasty was Antiochus IV. Antiochus IV. He called himself Pheo Antiochus Epiphanes. God manifested. Describing himself deity. I want you to know this is about him, what he did to the Jewish people. You're back, turn back to Daniel 9 again, before I read this. And let's read again verse 27, of where we are. 927, he, that is the prince that shall come, referring back to verse 25, the prince that shall come, he will confirm a covenant with the many for one seven, the last seven of the 77s that he's been talking about. 
But in the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end, that end, is decreed, is poured out on him. Now listen to what happened here. I can't read it all, so I've highlighted it. Now it came to pass after two years in the 145th year, on the 25th day of the month, if you notice there the dedication of feasts in John 8, uh, 10, 22, it was on the 25th of Kislev, which is equivalent to our December. On this 25th day of the month, which is by us called Kislev, that the king, Antiochus Epiphanes, came up to Jerusalem and pretended peace. He got possession of the city by treachery, at which time he spared not so much as those that admitted him in. It was in order to plunder its wealth, he ventured to break the league he had made. And we just read that in chapter 9, verse 27, peace, and then he breaks it. So he left the temple bare. He took away the golden candlesticks, the golden altar, the table of showbread, and the altar of burnt offering. He did not abstain from even the veils, which were made of fine linen and scarlet. He also emptied it of its secret treasures and left nothing at all remaining. And by this means cast the Jews into great lamentation. For he forbade them to offer those sacrifices which they used to offer to God according to the law. Notice that's what's going to happen here. And when he had pillaged the whole city, some of the inhabitants he killed. And some he carried captive, together with their wives and children. So that the multitude of those captives that were taken alive were over 10,000. He also burnt down the finest buildings. And when he had overthrown the city walls, he built a citadel in the lower part of the city. For the place was the lower part of the city. For the place was high and overlooked a temple on which account he fortified it with high walls and towers and put in a garrison of Macedonians. A multitude from whom it proved that the citizens suffered many and sore calamities. And when the king had built, listen, when the king had built an altar, an idol on the altar, upon God's altar, he slew pigs on it, swine. And so offered a sacrifice, neither according to the law nor the Jewish religious worship in the country. He compelled them to forsake the worship that they paid to their own God. He commanded them not to circumcise their sons and threatened to punish any that would be found to have transgressed his injections with death. He appointed overseers who should compel them to do what he commanded. But there were many who did not, some, the noblest ones, the best men. Those of the noblest souls did not regard him but paid a greater respect to the customs of their country than concern as to the punishment which he threatened to the disobedient. In other words, he killed them. On which account that every day underwent great miseries and bitter torments. They were whipped with rods. Their bodies were torn to pieces. They were crucified while they were still alive and breathing. 
They strangled the women. They strangled their sons. They hung their sons on the bodies of the women when they crucified them. And if there were any sacred books of the law found, they were destroyed. He spilled pig's broth all over them and then burned them with fire. He took the word of God, threw it in a pile, put pig's broth all over it to defile it, and then torched it, burned them with fire. Do you see similarities of what Daniel predicted, the prophet Daniel, by God's instruction? of what's going to happen in the tribulation period. Again, it says he will confirm a covenant with many for one seven, the last seven of the 77s, a group of seven, a heptab of seven, seven years. But in the middle of it, three and a half years, or as Daniel will say in chapter 10, time times half a time. Three and a half years in the middle, he will disregard his covenant. He will stop all the sacrifices of the temple that will be rebuilt. Both the bloody sacrifices, so-called, and the oblations, or the non-bloody ones, all of them. And according to what says here, he will set up an idol, just like Antiochus did, right on the altar of God, and force people to worship him, because he declares to be God. So we went through some of this last week. We looked at the he, the ruler who will come. We looked at those scriptures. And we stated that this is the last seven year period. And it begins with this covenant be made between this prince that shall come, this powerful political ruler, and the representatives of the Jewish people, Israel. Because this ruler will have the authority and ability to seemingly end the Middle East problem that exists right now. The world is against them, especially the Islamic world all around them. I was just reading uh, yesterday how that Russia is who's going to be a major player in this whole period of time. Russia and China are now linking arms with South Africa and in South Africa, they've opened it up to them to come there, China and Russia, for war games. All this is in preparatory for Ezekiel 38, 39. Need somebody there. They have said political leaders as a be he God or be he devil. We want somebody here who can bring us peace. And this man will say, I can. He'll have the power and the authority. Of course, Satan will be in back of him to do all that. So Israel will be able to rebuild the temple in the holy site, if they haven't done it already, and restore their sacrifices. They're under this covenant. He will promise them peace against their enemies. But as we mentioned, in the middle of this seven-year period, after three and a half years, this prince who will come will break his covenant. He will seize the temple. He will put an end to the blood sacrifices and the oblations, the non-bloody sacrifices, according to the scripture here, just like Antiochus did. Now, some people will say, well, maybe that fulfilled that. What Daniel said in 550 
BC, and maybe Antiochus was a fulfilling of that in 167 BC. No, it couldn't be because Jesus referred to it in Matthew 24 as future yet. Paul referred to it as future yet in 2 Thessalonians 2. John certainly referred to it in the entire book of the Revelation, especially chapter 13. It was still future. And many times prophecies are like that, a near fulfillment, a far fulfillment. And just for your own uh, sake, if you want to, read Daniel chapter 8. That's dealing with Antiochus more specifically than chapter 9 of Daniel. Anyway, the scripture says he will have his own image, an idol, put in the temple, in the holy place, and demand or force the Jewish people, as well as the world, according to Revelation 13, to worship him as God. This, my friend, is the abomination that causes desolation. Now, to much of the world it won't, but to the Jewish people it will. To put an idol in the temple or himself and declaring himself to be God and saying all of your religious practices must desist Stop! You worship me now! I got my altar here! The abomination that causes horror and great lamentation. And what did Jesus say in Matthew 24? In Matthew 24, Jesus, he said these words. Verse 15, talking to the Jewish people, talking to the disciples here. And he says, so when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation, spoken through the prophet Daniel, almost 600 years earlier, This hadn't been fulfilled yet, but it was coming. And when you see that, the generation that will be alive at that time, the Jewish people then that have built a temple, not built yet, but will build that temple under this false peace, he breaks that covenant. And he puts this idol or himself standing in the holy place and declares himself to be God, tells them all of their religious practices to be stopped on the pain of death. He says, when you see that, run. Run for your life. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of his house go down to take anything out of his house. How timely is that? Don't even go back in your house. Run. Flee. Let no one in the field go back to get his cloak. Without a coat, leave it. Run. Run. And if you're pregnant, verse 19, or you're nursing an infant, it's going to be terrible for you. How are you going to haul your child around? Or if you're pregnant, how are you going to run? And then he clarifies it, qualifies it. Verse 21. <clears throat> For then there will be a great tribulation. NIV, NIV says distress, flipless tribulation. Great tribulation. 
unequaled from the beginning of the world until then, until now, he says. And never to be equaled again. How bad is that? The Jewish people have suffered so much. Six million killed in the gas chambers and other places during the World War II. Many others under the Roman grab for power. Millions upon millions. And yet they are still a people. They still come back. God's people on earth. God's chosen possession. So run desolation, the abomination of desolation. Paul said the same thing. Probably have to close with that. Paul said the same thing of which we've looked at before in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It hadn't happened yet. But he said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, In verse 3, don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs, until the man of lawlessness is revealed, and the man doomed to destruction. Notice it says, he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple. It's not there yet, but it will be. God's temple. Proclaiming himself to be God. That is the abomination of desolation. Daniel uses that phrase 9.27 he uses that phrase in chapter 11 he uses that phrase in chapter 12 referring back to it this hasn't happened yet give me just two more minutes and I'm going to finish and then we're going to go into another section yay Next week. 27, until his end of this Antichrist, of this man of sin, this lawless one. Oof. Not too many papers. That's what it says, until his end. Daniel 7.11. Oh, that sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? 7.11. He was the first one that came up with that. Daniel 7.11. Daniel 11, 45, 2 Thessalonians 2, 8, Matthew 24, 30, Mark 13, 26, Luke 21, 27, Revelation, look at that. I knew we would get back to Revelation. Chapter 19. All that has occurred in the book of Revelation. And remember our outline, chapter 6, through 19 is this seven year period of time, this tribulation period. Revelation 9 through, or, or uh, yeah, 6 through 19. But at the end of 19, notice what happens. Verse 11. I saw in heaven standing open, there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on, that, on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, John 1.1. 1, 1. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh 
He has this name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Verse 19, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. How futile. That's why God laughs in Psalm 2. But the beast was captured, with him the false prophet, who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf, and with those signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur, and the rest of the people and the kings and all those that were there to war against the Lamb of God were killed with a sword that came out of the mouth of the rider, the horses. The final seven years, all of that to say the final seven years of Israel's history up to the kingdom will be this tribulation period. Thus, how long will the tribulation last? Seven years. Seven years. Now, just saying this in closing. You say, why did we go through all of that? I knew that it was a seven-year period. Well, you knew because you said you knew. How do you know? How do you know? You got to know the Word of God. You say, this is what the Word of God says, and I go back and I read it, and I read it, and I read it. That's how you know. It's one thing to just say, well, I believe this, but it's another thing to say, I believe because the God's Word says it. I know. And I'm going back here, and I'm reading it, and I'm seeing it, and that's how I know. That's how I know. We need to know the Word of God, especially in the times that we are in now to know the Word of God because it's a truth and you're beginning to see if you're paying attention all these things unfold before your eyes how exciting and if the rapture happens before the tribulation whew, how close can that be let's pray Lord God, thank you for your word. And we want to know your word. We want to understand your word. Even these prophecies that you gave so long ago, 25, 2600 years ago. And yet we see things like that happening now. Centered around your people, Israel. The epic center, if you will. And all that pertains to it. We're praying, God, that you will bless us with knowledge, understanding of your word so that we can know the truth, behold the truth as it's happening, and be aware of it. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.